Hello, I'm Anne Montgomery, Editor-in-Chief of Bioprocess International Magazine. I'm here at Biotech Week in Boston speaking with several thought leaders about advancements in bioprocessing and cell therapy development. I hope you enjoy their insights and their visions for the future. So my name is Nick Timmons. I'm the VP of Technology at CCRM and I'm also Director of Bridge at CCRM which is a $40 million collaboration between CCRM, GE Healthcare and the Federal Government of Canada focused on the development of next generation cell and gene therapy bioprocessing solutions. So a, a key focus of this collaboration is really about identifying where gaps are in the field for cell and gene therapy manufacturing solutions both on the process side of things as well as the technologies that we utilize to enable those processes. So when we look broadly at cell therapies, we have quite a range of players at different stages of development out there. We have those that are preclinical, considering clinical at all stages of the clinical development pipeline and increasingly we're seeing people that are looking to move into market. And what's become very, very clear and something we've, we've known for some time from the bioprocess biologics industry is that the earlier you start thinking about your manufacturing solutions, the easier your life will be in transitioning through that full pipeline process. So what we can uh, bring to that conversation is a broad understanding of the cell and gene therapy uh, specific aspects of this understanding the biology, understanding the engineering, and understanding the technologies that associate with that. Utilize that to really understand the challenges that individuals or individual companies are facing as well as the industry as a whole, and then right size the possible solutions that we can bring to that. A good example is you don't want to be going into a phase one study with your sizable investment that would be required to put in place your final process solution. Um, you are looking to ensure you make the right degree of investment at the right point in time in order to further your, um, your product towards its final destination. But at the same time, you don't want to underdo it either because a failure to address those challenges early on could see you increasingly pushed into locking down processes that are far from optimal or even if they are still acceptable in many respects, they may simply just be far more expensive than they need to be. And one of the big challenges we're facing in this space really is one around uh, the cost of goods. There's a, a general comment that often comes up that cell therapies are expensive and they will perhaps always be expensive, but when you look at it from a process technologies and manufacturing pro uh, perspective on there, there's no fundamental reason why they will always have to be expensive. A lot of it comes down to technology evolution, process evolution, understanding what those cost drivers are, and then tackling those cost drivers in the most appropriate manner. So philosophically, the, the same issues, uh, the drivers are very different. And even the, the underlying model in which one is producing these products can be very different. So if we look at the scene right now, autologous therapies, for example, are very, very popular. And that is an extremely different scenario to bulk manufacture of a protein product where you can basically do single large batches and you can make a year's product, well, several years product in a single run. When we start looking at autologous, or I like to use the term patient-specific because we have allogeneic therapies that are also small batches directed to individual patients, there's a lot of logistics to be dealt with there because you've got many, many small batches. There's a lot of testing over here. Each one of those batches has to be tested and qualified in its own right. And then we find for a lot of these things, there's also the challenges related to the logistics of incoming raw materials and then getting the right product, of course, back out to the right recipient. When we look at other types of therapies that are um, allogeneic or can be produced in bulk in some fashion, 
this moves us much more towards the protein side of things, but still orders of magnitude difference in the types of scales that we are at least currently operating at. Um, large scale in cell therapy uh, for many people is tens of liters, certainly hundreds of liters, and in some cases even, even smaller, versus the tens, 20,000 liter type scale that you get in the protein industry. We work with quite a variety of, of groups at, at various different stages. Uh, some of them really have quite a profound knowledge gap and within that group there are, are those who are very open to learning and, and they're very receptive to everything one and they're great to work with because you work through their challenges together of course and they, they can be a lot of fun. Um, they can be very conceptually basic aspects that they need to address of working through you know, what kind of yields of material do you need? Exactly how many patients, how much product do you ultimately think you're going to be producing? And start to get them thinking long term so that they can develop solutions now that will see them travel through that pathway. Whereas often these smaller companies will be very focused on what is the next critical milestone? How do we just get this into our phase one trial and not looking that much further beyond? Uh, for the more mature organisations, their needs are obviously quite different. They can come in with processes that are already quite well developed in the, in the basic um, way in which the material is, is handled and generated. They have reasonably good product understanding, but the manufacturing technologies they use may be not ideal for going to commercial launch down the track. Uh, so good examples here is the use of planar cultures in cell factories or even tea flasks is still fairly common in a lot of cases, but there is a, a good recognition now out there that transitioning to systems that are more amenable to further scale up and automation and full closure are out there. Now while a lot of companies have the understanding of this is something they need to move towards, they don't always have the experience or the knowledge to make that transition across. And of course, to start going that direction would require some, in some cases, reasonable amounts of investment to do that. So to be able to come to them with some of that experience, with some of the hardware in place, and to be able to speak to them about what some of those options are and work through with them is really the way to approach that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really a matter of thinking as soon as possible about where you want to be. There's always a lot of focus on where people are right now and where they're going to be next year, but looking where you want to be five years, 10 years, you know, what's your ultimate objective on the market and how can you put the thinking and the processes in place now to address that? The other key element I'd like to mention would be really taking concepts from the quality by design kind of space. So making sure that you put in very robust approaches to evaluating your risk, what your critical process parameters are, your critical quality attributes, and setting up powerful experimental designs which will allow you to extract a maximum amount of data, but also give you down the track maximum flexibility in your operating space that you can move within. So that the concept of in your development phase, getting a good understanding of your design space. So now instead of working within a, a one or two dimensions of a particular set point or, or operating points on your process, you can move more multi-dimensionally within a space and have confidence that your product is still going to meet its requirements at the end of the day.